Hello Trinity Tigers and welcome to Learning Together, live webinar series as part of lifelong learning initiatives presented by Trinity University's Office of Alumni Relations. I am Robert Martin, class of 2001 and 2003, and I serve on the Healthcare Administration Alumni Association Board. It is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar speaker, Dr. Ramir Kaisi who is an award-winning professor in the Healthcare Administration Department at Top 10 Nationally Ranked Program. Dr. Kaisi teaches courses in healthcare management, strategic planning, marketing and human resources, and he directs the executive program. He has a passion for speaking on leadership, executive coaching, emotional intelligence, physician leadership, strategic planning and convenient care models. He is a certified physician and executive coach. Dr. Kaisi lives in San Antonio with his wife, Wafa, and two children, Maria and Adam. Professor Kaisi will discuss intangibles, the unexpected traits of high-performing leaders. The discussion will help us understand the importance of four traits in leadership, humility, compassion, kindness, and generosity. Discuss the latest research evidence that shows how effectively implementing these four traits can lead to high performance, and implement behavioral changes that are compatible with these four traits. Please know that you will be able to submit your questions as you listen to Dr. Kaisi, and he will be happy to answer them following the presentation. And if you really like the topic, feel free to go in and get his book, Intangibles, The Unexpected Traits of High-Performing Healthcare Leaders, which is available on Amazon or through the American College of Healthcare Executives website. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kaisi. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate you being here. And thank you for everyone, all the uh, viewers and all the listeners that are here with us today. I really appreciate you taking time during your lunch hour, um, and hopefully this will be valuable and you will um, learn something new about leadership and the unexpected traits of high-performing leaders. Um, again, I'm Amir Kaisi. I'm with the Healthcare Administration Department. And actually, this coming August is a major milestone for me as I'll be celebrating my 15th anniversary at Trinity. And it's been a great journey. I've enjoyed every single minute of it. But let's go back to the topic for today, which is the traits of high-performing leaders. Um, as you know, I'm in healthcare. I, most of my research are in the area of healthcare administration, but what I'm going to be talking about are traits that are universal to every industry and every organization. So the lessons will apply universally to all the uh, industries, no matter where you're working at. So um, last month, I was watching the Winter Olympics with my family, and I really enjoyed watching the games. And what I noticed was that there was one country that did much better than anyone else. And I'm going to give you a few seconds here to think about which country collected the most medals. Well, if you said Norway, then you were correct. Norway actually collected more medals than everyone else, not just at these games, but in, in history. And, you know, Norway sent about 100 athletes to the Olympic Games. The United States sent 240 athletes, and yet Norway outperformed everyone else. So I started thinking, you know, what, what is the secret? This Norway is a, such a tiny country. It's about the size of Atlanta, Georgia. They have 5 million people who live in Norway. So how do we explain the success that Norway has had so far? Some might say, oh, it's the weather, it's their genetics, their training, and all of that. And all of these apply, definitely. But they are not unique. Norway is not unique in having that weather or those, the, the training programs. So I did a little bit of digging, and what I you know, found out was, um, something really important that the director of the Norway Olympic team said when he was asked about their secrets He said our secret is no jerks. They have zero tolerance for jerks No matter what amount of skill you may have you're not gonna make the team If you are not humble if you don't show respect and if you don't put the team first so you know this this was um, really an important thing to realize that that their secret has to do with those traits now, No Jerks could have been the title of my book. Instead, it's Intangibles, The Unexpected Trait of High-Performing Healthcare Leaders. And as, as Robert said, um, I published this book last year because, honestly, there aren't enough leadership books out there. No, not really. <laughs> there are a lot of leadership books out there. Um, but the reason why I published the book is because I didn't feel that there were enough evidence-based leadership books. You'll find a lot of leadership books that are based on anecdotes. 
and personal experience. But you don't see a lot of science and a lot of research there. And that's what I try to do in this book is to look at the science and what does the science say about the traits of high performing leaders. Well, according to the science and the research, the traits of high performing leaders are those leaders that are able to combine humility, compassion, kindness, and generosity with ambition, competence, accountability, and strength. These are the leaders that are able to achieve high performance for themselves, for their teams, and for their organizations. So this is my argument for today. And just like I do, did it in the book, I'm going to make it today, not based on my own opinion, not based on you know, gut feeling and, and anecdotes, although there will be some anecdotes, but based on science and based on research. So let's get started. The, the plan is to talk about humility and its counterpart, narcissism, and then to move on to compassion, kindness, and generosity, and hopefully end up with some take-home behavior, some stuff that you can leave or you can, when you log off today, you can take with you to your office some things that you're going to be doing differently than what you normally do. So starting with humility, um, let me provide some background research why I got interested in this humility uh, issue. So in 2014, the Harvard Graduate School of Education interviewed 10,000 middle school and high school students from all over the country and asked them, what is most important to you today? So about 48% um, said it was achievement, 30% said it was happiness, and only 22% said it was caring for others. So that really got me thinking and got me concerned as an educator. Now remember, these are middle school and high school students. So these are the same students that we're going to have in our classrooms at Trinity very soon and, and in our you know, undergraduate and graduate programs. And only one in five considered caring for others as their number one priority. So I, I started doing a little bit more digging into this issue of caring for others, empathy, as well as narcissism. And what I found out is that researchers have been tracking narcissism among younger Americans for a while now. There's something called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory, which is a 40-question um, instrument survey that you can take online, and I encourage everyone to take it. And what you can do is, is you can find out what's your, your narcissism score. And what the evidence shows us is in the last 20 years, narcissism is constantly on the rise. Okay? And you know, there, there is an ideal score there between 10 and 15 that's considered healthy narcissism. And what we see is among students and Americans, uh, uh, younger Americans in general, is the score is going from 15 to 17 to 18 and constantly increasing. So the point is there's enough evidence that among college graduates, narcissism is on the rise and empathy is on the decline. Now, narcissism, as we all know, the term narcissism comes from the Greek god Narcissus that fell in love with his own reflection in the water. Now, this was back in the days. What about today? Well, today, the modern-day narcissist is, is the, you know, <laughs> homo selfies, if you want to call him, right? The, the you know, the, the selfie millennial who's, who's taking selfies all the time. And there's all kind of research on selfies that shows that it takes about seven minutes for a millennial to take a selfie. Um, that's an hour of selfie taking per week for, for a total of 26,000 selfies per lifetime. So before we get too alarmed here, and despite this rise in narcissism among younger Americans, humility is making a comeback in business and in leadership. So a few years ago, the Wall Street Journal made the case for humble executives and, and discussed how boards of large companies these days are actually looking for humble CEOs, those that listen well, that admit their errors, and are willing to share the limelight. Harvard Business Review also made a strong case based on research that the best leaders are humble leaders. So what does it mean to be humble? What is, what is humility? Humility is, comes that the word humility comes from the Latin humus, not to be mistaken with the delicious Middle Eastern dip, obviously. It's, it's, uh, humus means close to the ground or to the earth. And applying that to leadership, humble leaders are those that are close to the ground, which means they're close to their employees. They don't spend the majority of their time in their ivory tower, in, the, in their corner office, but are rather out there talking to their employees and their followers and their team members and trying to understand their, their concerns and trying to solve their problems. So what does, uh, who, who can, can um, you know, um, demonstrate this kind of humility? One of the great examples that I like to use is a guy by the name of Jim Senegal. Now, Senegal is not a celebrity CEO, but he was the CEO of Costco for a long period of time. He's the previous CEO of Costco. And Senegal was one of those humble leaders. 
he didn't know much about him outside the organization, but inside his organization, he was a legend. And the reason why he was a legend is because he displayed all the characteristics of a humble leader. For example, Senegal did not have an office in Costco's headquarters because he spent the majority of his time going from Costco store to Costco store to talk to the employees and understand what their problems were. When he showed up, his name tag said Jim. It didn't say the CEO. It didn't say your supreme leader. It didn't say any of these things. It just said Jim. So you could have mistaken him for one of the clerks working at the store. Another important thing about Senegal is that he believed that employees should be paid um, generously and fairly and should get benefits. And he also believed that he shouldn't get an outrageous salary like all the other major uh, CEOs of major corporations. One of the things that, that he said is that obscene salaries of high-level executives send the wrong message through a company. The message is that all brilliance you know, comes from the top and that the worker on the floor of the store or the factory is insignificant. So that's why I think Senegal is one of those leaders that, that portrayed that kind of humility that we're talking about. And by the way, if you look at Costco and how Costco performed over the years and compare it to one of its major competitors, um, Sam's Club, which is run by Walmart, which has a different approach to treating employees, you can see Costco constantly outperforming um, Walmart in terms of growth and, and uh, profit and, and all of that. So what, what is humble leadership? The way I understand, it, understand humble leadership is that humble leadership consists of four main components. It consists of being authentic, teachable, transparent, and humane. What does that mean? Authentic leaders are those that admit that they make mistakes and ask people for their patience. Now, obviously, you're not making mistakes, hopefully, every single day or every single um, you know, week and, and asking for, for uh, patience. But it's those when they make a mistake, they own up to their mistake. They're authentic. Similarly, a teachable leader is a leader that says, I was wrong, and asks their employees, their team members, for their forgiveness. Another aspect of humble leadership is transparency, which is saying, I don't know. Do not think that you're always going to be the smart, smartest person in the room, but rather rely on the talents of and the ideas of your team members. And finally, a humble leader is someone who's humane, who admits their shortcomings and their limitations and say, I can't do it all. I need your talents. I need your help. So to summarize, being humble is about being authentic, teachable, transparent, and humane. However, and this is a very important point that I want to make, it's probably one of the most important points in, in our webinar today, is that humility is not weakness or lack of confidence or having no ambition or no assertiveness. On the opposite, humility is about being strong, being confident in your abilities, being ambitious and being assertive, but not doing it in an over-the-top way. Now, this is all great. This is a great model and it's good to talk about it, but again, what does the empirical evidence say? What do we know about humble leaders? To understand humble leaders, we have to go back to the beginning. And the beginning for me is the best-selling management book, Good to Great. And, and some of the uh, listeners and viewers may be familiar with Good to Great. For those of them that are not familiar with it, I'm going to provide just a quick summary of, of what Jim Collins and his teams did. So Collins and his team set out to understand what is unique about those organizations that are able to outperform our other organizations. So what they did is they looked at um, organizations over a period of 15 years, and they tried to see which organizations did better in terms of um, their financial performance over that period of time. And what they found out was there were 11 companies that started at a level that was good and then ended the 15 years at a great level. So they outperformed everyone else during this period of 15 years. And they want to understand what makes those companies unique. They found a lot of different characteristics that were um, common among those organizations. But one of the things that surprised them the most was they were expecting the leaders, the CEOs of these companies to be the big ego CEOs, the celebrity CEOs, you know, the larger than life charismatic CEOs. And what they found out was the total opposite. They found out that these organizations were led by level five leaders. And level five leaders are those that have a blend of personal humility and professional will. Now, these were not weak CEOs by any stretch of the imagination. They were humble, but they were fiercely determined. They made bold decisions, and they led their organizations from being good to being great uh, at the end. Now, Good to Great is a great book, but it was published in the year 2000. And the sample size is 11 companies. So some people may say, all right, what, what is some more recent research that has been done in, in larger sample sizes? 
So one of the recent studies that looked at this issue of humility among leaders is actually a study among um, in, Mid in a Midwestern health services organization where the employees were asked to rate the humility of their leaders. And then what the researchers did was ask the employees how happy, how engaged they were, and then they measured their work performance. So those employees that agreed or rated their leaders as humble, which is the leader perceives himself or herself accurately, displays appreciation of other strengths, and is teachable. So those employees that rated their leader to be humble actually were happier, were less likely to leave the organization, felt more empowered, and as importantly, performed better individually and in their teams. So we're starting to see that this issue of leader humility is not just a touchy-feely thing, all right? It's not about warm, fuzzy feelings, but it's about performance. I don't care what industry you work in, what organization you're working in today. I'm sure you are working, you are tracking employee engagement, you are tracking um, employee empowerment, you are tracking your individu their individual performance and their team performance. So we're starting to see that leadership humility is actually can be a competitive advantage for organizations. Now let's move to another setting. This study comes to us from Chinese private firms in which they wanted to see the effect of leader humility on their middle managers and their top manager team. So they wanted to see if the leader was more humble than, than um, in other organizations, does that trickle down? So here again, when people rated the leader as being self-aware, open to feedback, appreciating others, having a low self-focus and appreciating the greater good, the top and middle managers themselves were more likely to collaborate, to share information, to make joint decisions, and to have a shared vision. So the humble leaders set the tone, create a culture in which people are encouraged to collaborate and work with each other so they have a strong influence on the whole organization. So I hope that this, through, through this limited evidence, I have um, convinced you somehow that humble leaders make the best leaders. But then the question becomes, what about those charismatic narcissists, right? What about narcissism? We all have examples of narcissists that are very successful, right? Steve Jobs comes to mind, for example. So what about these types of leaders? The question to ask is, are narcissistic leaders successful because of their narcissism or despite of their narcissism? So that's the question that I would like to explore. And to start with, I'd like to um, share the example of Larry Ellison. Um, if you're not familiar with Larry Ellison, he's, he's the CEO of Oracle, which is a uh, computer technology company. Now, Ellison is the poster child of the charismatic narcissistic CEO. I mean, he, he's the celebrity CEO with the big ego and, and, you know, the expensive yachts and the mansions and whatever. He has all of these things. When one of his employees was asked to describe him, he said the difference between God and Larry is that God does not believe he is Larry. All right? So that tells you a lot about Ellison and his leadership style. However, what we need to remember is that Ellison was very successful. He started Oracle with $1,200 of his own money and took it into a billion-dollar um, company. So narcissists can be successful, and that's why we want to look at the empirical evidence. What does the evidence tell us about the success of narcissists? Well, what we, what we know from research and from personal experience is that narcissists, because they are self-promoting, confident, extroverted, and entertaining, they tend to be chosen more for leadership positions because of their um, charismatic personality, the, the, their magnetism, they charm you. That when you're talking to them, you just feel like you know, they're, they're really interesting. And that's why in job interviews, they tend to do much better than other types of, of leaders, and they tend to be chosen more for leadership positions. But this is only initially. Over time, the research shows us that narcissists tend to be hostile, arrogant, cold, poor managers, and are not team players. And as a result, over time, Narcissists are viewed as ineffective leaders by the people that they are leading. So here we're starting to realize and understand that there are two different phenomena going on. There is something called leadership emergence versus leadership effectiveness. And the traits that affect emergence are different than the traits that affect effectiveness. To better understand this idea of emergence versus effectiveness, we need to examine a very complex management theory called the chocolate cake model. Right? So the chocolate cake model argues that dealing with a narcissistic leader is very similar to the experience of eating a whole chocolate cake. Think about it. The first few bites of the chocolate cake are amazing, right? The richness of the texture and the flavors, it's, it's really good. 
However, as you eat more and more of that chocolate cake and you're halfway or three quarters of the way through that cake, you're gonna get nauseous and you're gonna throw up. Same applies to interacting with a narcissistic leader. The first few encounters are great because of their magnetic personality, how charming they are. You, you feel like you wanna work for them. But after working for them for a while, you realize that you're not really enjoying work with them because they only think about themselves. Now, what is the evidence about the relationship between narcissism and effectiveness? What do the studies show us? This is a great study that looked at um, 1,900 individuals with leadership responsibilities, and they looked at their 360-degree feedback. For, for those um, listeners and viewers that are not familiar with that kind of feedback, this is when you ask, when they ask your boss, your, your um, coworkers, your colleagues, as well as your subordinates. They ask them about, to give you feedback about your leadership uh, effectiveness. And what this study showed was that the relationship between effectiveness and narcissism is an inverted U-shaped curve, which means that high levels of narcissism are not good, but also low levels of narcissism are not that good. So there's a sweet spot right there in the middle, which we call healthy narcissism or humble narcissism. Now, what about this issue of charisma, right? The charisma is related to narcissism, but it's not exactly the same thing. What, this is another study that looked at this issue of charisma. And let me explain what, what the findings were. So on, on the horizontal axis there, you're looking at the charisma score that people gave themselves. So they take a test that rates them on charisma. And then on the, on the vertical axis is leadership effectiveness. And the blue line is how people rate themselves. The orange line is how others rate them. And as you can see, as charisma increases, self-rating increases, but it also keeps on increasing and increasing. However, observer rating at some point in time starts going down. And this is the dangerous area. This is where arrogance comes into play. So charisma is good to a certain point, but when it becomes excessive, it's not that good. And here I agree with what Angela Merkel, the German chancellor said. When she was asked about charisma, she said, you can't solve tasks with charisma. She is very well known to be down to earth, to be practical and pragmatic. And as a result, she doesn't think that charisma is that important for the job of the leader. Now, as I mentioned, we've done research in healthcare, and I'll share some of that research with you. So we uh, surveyed executives, directors, and employees in, in 10 health systems. And one of the questions that we asked them is to think about that one leader that they have observed to be the least successful. So someone that is not successful in terms of improving outcomes in the organization, getting things done. Someone that they know personally. We wanted, to think of, we wanted them to think about that one person, and then we gave them a list of leadership traits and asked them to describe that one person. And the top five traits, according to our survey, were people who blame others, are self-focused, are inconsiderate, arrogant, and insensitive. All of them are traits of narcissists. So we've talked about humility, we've talked about narcissism. Now let's talk more about compassion and kindness. And things are going to get a little bit more touchy-feely here, so here's a warning for you all. Um, compassion, right? Compassion is, is not typically a term that you hear in organizations or in business and in leadership. However, lack of empathy and lack of compassion has been in the news recently. If you were following the news closely last year, you remember the whole debacle with the United Airlines and the passenger that was dragged out of the plane and the really lack of empathy when the CEO tried to apologize for the mistake. We also have seen a lot of lack of empathy coming from Google and the previous CEO, Travis Kalanick, in terms of how he deals with his employees and, and his, his drivers and the customers and so on and so forth. But what does compassion mean? When I think of compassion, I think of it as operating at three different levels. First, at the cognitive level, it says, I understand you. I know what you're going through. At the emotional level, it says, I feel for you. And then at the behavioral level, it says, I want to help you. Now that's great, but how does it apply in leadership? We're starting to see a lot of emphasis on compassion and empathy and leadership among leadership experts. Many of the viewers and listeners will be familiar with Simon Sinek and, and, and you know his, his book on, on focusing on the why and all of that. Sinek actually argues in, in a great book called Eat, Leaders Eat Last, he argues that empathy, which is the ability to recognize and share others' feelings, is the essence of leadership. It's one of the most important aspects of leadership and that leaders who care about those that they are leading and understand that the true cost of, uh, true cost of leadership comes at the expense of self-interest. Again, this is a great opinion, but what does the empirical evidence tell us about compassion? 
So Gallup, the, the polling company, has been conducting interviews with leaders and followers for the last 30 years. They've interviewed a lot of those. And they ask followers, what do you seek from your leader? What do you want your leader to have? And over time, repeatedly and consistently, in all industries all over the world, what people say they want from their leader is compassion, trust, stability, and hope. They also ask the followers whether they agree or not with the statement, my supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person. That's a typical engagement question that is asked in, in employee surveys. Now, those people that agree with that statement tend to, be more, tend to say they're more likely to stay in the organization, they have more engaged customers, are more productive, and generate more profits for their organization. So here again, just like we saw with humility, when it comes to compassion and empathy, it's not just about warm, fuzzy feelings. It's about some cold-hearted metrics that really matter and that every organization in every industry is tracking these days. Back to our survey, we also asked people to think about the one leader that they have observed to be the most successful. So this is the opposite of the first question. This one, someone that, has been, that you know that has been very successful in terms of improving outcomes. How do you describe that individual? As you can see, the top five traits here are accountable, collaborative, holds others accountable, calm, and compassionate. So we see that there is a balance, and, and this is an important uh, message here, is while people are collaborative and compassionate, they have to balance that with accountability and with holding others accountable. So compassion is a prerequisite for kindness. So let's talk about kindness. And, and kindness is more compassion and action. That's what you see, right? Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that kindness doesn't have a place at work these days. People are, are saying that they do not have time to be nice at work. A recent book um, called Mastering Civility Ask people, why do you behave unkindly at work? Why do you behave in an uncivil way? And these are some of what people said. Because I'm overloaded. I don't have time to be nice. Because my leader is disrespectful. So here we see the opposite of the trickle-down effect of humility. If someone, if your boss is disrespectful to you or treats you rudely, you're going to take it on your own team and treat them in the same way. And finally, because my company lacks the guidelines or the training to, about how to treat people. Now, what is really serious is that bosses do not value, do not reward kindness anymore in the workplace. And a lot of people have some strong arguments against kindness. They believe that if you are kind, it's because you don't have the guts to be anything else, because you're weak, because you're touchy-feely. You know, you don't want to confront others. You're not competitive. You don't want to be accountable for your actions. And while it's true that in some situations, in some exceptions, there are people that are like that who are, you know, kind but weak and, and uncompetitive. The truth is the majority of leaders that lead with kindness are actually strong. They value their employees. They give honest feedback. They encourage the growth of their, of their team members and their mentees. They communicate their expectations and they act firmly and, and fairly. So again, kindness is not about being weak but rather about sitting down with employees. When there is a need for providing honest feedback, they do provide that honest feedback and they communicate the expectations. What are some examples of kindness in organizations? This next example might surprise some people. What I'm, I like to talk about is Chick-fil-A. Yeah, Chick-fil-A, regardless of your preferences in, in fast food, Chick-fil-A is one of those organizations that has kindness as part of its organizational DNA. As you know, Chick-fil-A hires um, teenagers. Most, most of them, it's their first job. They train them on this concept of kindness. You know, they bring the food to your table. They pull the chair for you. They ask you, may I refresh your beverage and stuff like that. But it goes beyond just the employees. The store owners themselves also drink the Kool-Aid and, and are on board with the kindness. There are a lot of stories of what store owner, Chick-fil-A store owners have done over the last few years. My favorite stories are um, a few years ago, there was um, um, a snowstorm in, in Birmingham, in Alabama, and people were stranded on the highway in their cars. So one uh, Chick-fil-A store owner um, actually took the food to the people who were stranded on the highway and, and distributed food for free for that in an act of kindness. Another example here in Texas, in the small town of Rockwall, after a certain tornado had hit the town, the um, Chick-fil-A store owner actually opened the store on a Sunday, which goes against company policy, so he can serve people who were displaced from their home and provide shelter for others. So we can see that there is a lot of kindness going on in some organizations. 
Now, when I give similar talks around the country, I go to um, different healthcare organizations, I talk to them about kindness, and I ask them to share their kindness stories with me. One of the, my, my most favorite kindness stories comes from a, an endocrinologist who told us the story of a patient that came to see him. And the patient was severely overweight, right? This was one of those diabetic patients that was severely overweight and was um, there for a foot exam. So after the foot exam was over, the patient was trying to reach and put his socks on and put his shoes on, but he wasn't managing to because of, of, his, of his size. So the doctor knelt down on his knees and helped that patient put his socks on and his shoes on. Now the patient was embarrassed, but mostly was very touched by that act of kindness. Here you had this endocrinologist, this, you know, this, this professional who was down on his knees helping him put his socks on. Six months later, that patient came back having lost 60 pounds. The patient told the doctor, said, I've been trying to lose weight throughout my whole life and I've never managed to lose weight. This is the first time that I've done it and I've done it because of your act of kindness. So obviously in healthcare, we, we are in, a, in an industry that is a compassion and kindness industry, but I think the lessons apply to all other industries. Again, these are good stories, they're, they're feel-good stories, and we all like the feel-good stories, but I want to take us back to the evidence. What does the evidence say about kindness? Let's start with the price of unkindness or rudeness or incivility. This is a study of managers and employees in different industries. And what they did is they asked people how they felt when they were on the receiving end of rudeness. So when someone at work treats you rudely, such as embarrasses you, or humiliates you in public, or makes sure to, to show that you are wrong, what, what, you know, to, to um, show you off, what, what are the effects of that on people? As you can see from those answers, people tend to decrease their work effort. If they can control it, they spend the amount of time that they spend at work. The quality of their work goes down. They spend a lot of time worrying about the rudeness. They try to avoid the offender so that their performance declines their commitment to the organization declines. Sometimes they take their frustration on customers, and many of them end up leaving the organization because of that uncivil treatment. Some other research has asked employees to classify their boss as either kind or as a bully. And this is a survey from the American Management Association. Those employees that said, my boss is kind, 84% of them said they plan to work for the company for a long time. Now compare that with those that said, my boss, my boss is a bully. 47%, so about half said that they plan to work for the org company for a long time. So here we're starting to see that kindness, again, is a business imperative. If we are serious about employee turnover, about you know, turnover rates and, and employee engagement and employee empowerment, we have to think about the importance of kindness in the workplace. However, and I hope by now this message is clear, Kindness is not enough by itself. This is one of my favorite studies um, in, that are done on this topic. And the reason I like this study is because it's a large study from hundreds of companies all around the world. So this transcends culture, countries, um, organizations, industries, and all of that. And what they did here is they asked employees to classify their boss as either, as either tough or nice. So those, uh, you know, tough bosses were described as those that establish high standards. They get me to stretch for goals I didn't think I could achieve, or they keep me focused on my goals. A nice boss is someone that is in touch with my issues and concern, develops me, maintains my trust, and so on and so forth. And they wanted to see which approach engages employees the most. As you might expect, the results showed that if your boss is just tough, only 8.9% of the employees were highly engaged. If your boss was nice, only 6.7%. The best approach was to be both tough and nice to hold the employees accountable and to try to build a um, strong relationship with them and, and, and maintain their trust and focus on their development. A great book that I suggest for everyone is a recent book by Kim Scott, a, an executive from Apple and, and Google by the name of Radical Candor. And Scott argues that the best leaders are those that can combine caring personally and challenging their employees directly. You can't just care without challenging and you can't just challenge without caring. You have to combine both in order to um, reach high performance. So now we get to our last topic before we get to the take-home behaviors, um, which is the issue of generosity. When I think of generosity, one of the examples that I think about is the example of um, Hamdi Olukaya. 
the CEO of Chobani. Ulukaya is really the embodiment of the American dream. He's a Turkish uh, immigrant that came to the U.S. to go to school, ended up buying an abandoned plant, um, started making Greek yogurt, and as they say, the rest of history, the, com the company is now one of the most successful companies. However, while the yogurt itself is very delicious, the secret of Chobani is the culture that Ulukaya has put in place. He's one of those CEOs that are very generous with their employees. There are stories of him showing up when employees are working on holidays and serving dinner to the employees. He also emphasizes the importance of paying people fairly and generously, giving them benefits and all of that. He hires refugees, he, he brings translators, he brings um, transportation for them because he believes that when a refugee has a job, they stop becoming a refugee. Now, Chobani is um, still owned by Ulokai himself. It hasn't gone public yet. But in preparation for it going public, what Ulokai did was he gave shares of the company to those employees who started the company with him in order of their seniority. So once the company goes public, which is expected to be very soon, some of these employees are going to get anywhere between $150,000 to $1 million when, from, from, from their shares. And this is what he said when he announced that to, their, to the employees. He told them, this is not a gift, but a mutual promise to work together with a shared purpose and responsibility. You know, how we, we built this company is important, but I want you to be part of the growth and part of the driving force. That's, that's a great example of a generous leader. So generous leaders are those that give from their time, from their energy, and from their talents, right? But what does the evidence tell us about generosity in leadership? I've made a lot of book recommendations. Here's another great book that you may want to check out. Give and Take by Adam Grant, uh, Wharton professor. Grant looks at it, this issue of generosity, and he classified people according to <coughs> givers, takers, and matchers. Givers are those uh, type of people that give and don't expect anything in return. Takers are those that are so self-centered that they take and they take and they take and they don't give it back in return. And then matchers are those types of individuals that like to keep a balance. You know, I will only give to you if I think that you can return the favor. And the obvious question here is, what type is most successful, right? The givers, the takers, or the matchers? So they did research on professional engineers. And they asked them to rate each other on their giving and taking behaviors. But they also looked at their work performance. And what they found out was that those employees who performed the worst were the givers. You with me? Or make, make sure that you're hearing this correct. So givers were the worst performers. Matchers and takers were in the middle, and then the highest performers were also givers. They repeated the same study among medical, students, uh, medical school students in Belgium. And here again, they found that the students who got the lowest grades were givers. The students who got the, middle, the grades in the middle were takers and matchers. And then the students who got the highest grades were also givers. So what's going on here? What's happening is that we have givers on one end of the spectrum. We have matchers and takers in the middle. And then we also have givers on the other end of the spectrum in terms of the highest performing students or, or employees or whatever, engineers. So what's happening here is that the givers that are lowest performing are those that we tend to think about as pushovers. So these are the people who give but forget about themselves. For example, among the medical students, these were the students that help everyone else study and you know, copied notes and stuff like that, but forgot about their own studying. The givers, on the other hand, on the other end of that, were the successful givers. So these are the ones that give, but they protect their time. They make sure that they are also um, you know, keeping their self-interest in mind. So Grant makes the point that leaders have this unique opportunity to multiply themselves and create networks of givers. So as a leader, you may say, yeah, I would like to give others, but my time is limited. And the point here is that you don't have to mentor everyone else in your organization and talk with everyone else. But what you can do is you can mentor a small team and then task them with mentoring others. And this way, you, they, they uh, pay it forward and you create a culture of giving and a network of givers within your organization. All right, so this is the last part of the presentation. And this is the part where I hope that you take some things with you that you can um, do differently in your organization, in your work, or even with your family. And what I'm going to focus on are issues such as how to listen, how to speak, how approachable you are, how you give credit to others, how do you give negative feedback, how do you handle crisis and failure, how you respond to success, and how you handle criticism. I'm going to pick a few of these and talk about them in detail. 
Let's start with how to listen. The unkind behavior is listening to reply, whereas the kind behavior is listening to understand. And we are all guilty of that. We're talking to someone, and as they're, they're talking to us, we're formulating our response before they even finish. The best approach is to listen to understand and let the other person make their point before you um, chime in. The unkind behavior is to make statements all the time, whereas the kinder one and the more effective one is to ask, ask questions. And there's all kind of evidence now these days that shows that asking questions can lead to higher performance in organizations. I've made a lot of book recommendations. This is a TED Talk recommendation. This is one of my favorite TED Talks out there um, by, by Celeste Hadley, who is an NPR journalist. Hadley talks about 10 different ways to have a better conversation, and many of these revolve around how to listen. So I, I uh, suggest that you check it out. So we've talked about how to listen. How about how to speak? The unkind behaviors or the unkind leaders are those that are using I and me all the time. More kind is to say we and us. It's the team. It's the organization. The unkind leader is the one who sees you and says how are you, but they don't really mean it. Whereas an, a kind behavior is the authentic how are you. They ask you how are you and they're listening because they really care about you and your family and what, what your news are. Unkind behavior is obviously using obscene language. I hope no one is working in an environment where people are using obscene disrespectful language, whereas the kind behavior is using the respectful language. The next thing that I'd like to focus on is how approachable you are. How do others see you? From the very basic simple stuff such as frowning versus smiling. Having a closed door versus having an open door, but you protect your time when needed. Again, you don't want to be a pushover. You don't want people to take advantage of your generosity and your kindness. And my favorite or least favorite is listening while checking the phone versus putting the phone aside when listening. This is something that we're all guilty of and that we all can work on when we're talking with others. Organizations are now going to great length about this issue of cell phones and, and cell phones during meeting. And what they've done is some organizations now have a, a case like this one um, by the door of the conference room and when on your way into the meeting you put your, your cell phone in there. And what they found is that when people don't have their phones on during the meeting, they can slash meeting times by half. So it's a very efficient approach. Another aspect of how approachable you are is whether you leave the office or you're around on your units regularly. In healthcare, this is becoming a best practice now where the CEOs and the um, members of the executive team are constantly and periodically rounding on their um, middle managers, on their employees, on their patients to try to go out there and see what's happening. A lot of leaders out there are always on their phone while walking in the hallway. You want to walk in the hallway and greet others and talk to them. Another aspect of kind leadership is how you give credit to others. Many people hesitate to give credit to others because they think it's part of their job. But you really want to think, tell people you're going above and beyond. You want to catch people doing something good, and you want to provide positive feedback that is prompt, accurate, and sincere. And one of the best ways to do that is still the old-fashioned way of thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes. There's really nothing that replaces handwritten thank you notes, in my opinion. One of the leaders that have done that year in and year out is Doug Conant, the retired CEO of Campbell's Soup. Conant took uh, Campbell's Soup when it was on the verge of bankruptcy and turned it around. And when people asked him, what was your secret? What was the secret of your success? He said, handwritten um, personal notes. In 10 years of um, his, his uh, being a CEO at Campbell's, he, he wrote about 30,000 thank you notes to all the employees and the different stakeholders. How do you give negative feedback? This, this is an important one, right? We see a lot of leaders that attack the person. The unkind leaders, they attack the person. But what you want to do is you want to separate the person from the job. You still want to give constructive feedback. Here again, we're not shying away from giving the negative feedback, but there is a way to do it. Even if you're terminating people, right, you can still do it in a way that keeps that employee's dignity, obviously, if they haven't done anything immoral or illegal. All right, we're almost there. And there are bonus points here for those who can guess which great philosopher said this great line. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. If you guessed it's the great philosopher Mike Tyson, then you guessed it right. And the reason I have this quote here is because most of us, most of the time, we are kind, we are compassionate. When the world is going according to our plan, when we've got our morning coffee and there's no traffic and everything is good, yeah, we can be kind and compassionate. But the really true compassionate and kind leaders are those that are compassionate and kind under crisis, when there are mistakes that happen. 
Are you the kind that yells and screams? Do you look for immediate blame? And are you the kind that has this hollow apology of mistakes were made? Or are you the one who is calm and controlled? You look for the underlying reasons. And finally, you admit, I made the wrong call, back to our earlier point about humble leaders. Last book recommendation, this is a great book written by two Navy SEALs. They talk about extreme ownership, that the leader owns everything in his or her own words. There are really no excuses and no one else to blame. If it happened in your unit, in your division, in your organization, it's your mistake and you have to own up to it and you have to fix it. All right, so let me finish by telling you um, this story. I was giving a similar presentation to a group of anesthesiologists um, a couple months ago. And towards the end of the presentation, one of them asked me, he said, so should we look to be feared or should we look to be loved, right? Should we look for fear or for love? So I thought about it and you know, the best answer that I could give him was from the world's best boss, Michael Scott, obviously from the office. So when Michael was asked, would you rather be feared or you love? He said, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. And with that, I will finish the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and we're open now for questions. We will um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. And if you enjoyed the presentation, as Robert said, please check the book out. Um, reach out to me by email on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to, to uh, answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kaisi. My pleasure. Um, so while we're waiting for questions to come in, I had one question just in, over the course of your research, and you hit on the topic of narcissism. Uh -huh. And um, I wanted to know uh, if you were able to draw any conclusions specifically if narcissism was actually more expected or more rewarded potentially in certain types of industries rather than others. I know a lot of your research is focused yeah. on healthcare, but you gave a lot of general industry sure, examples sure, today. Sure, no, that, that, that's a great question. And, and um, obviously you, you may find some industries where um, it's more expected, such as you know the financial industry, Wall Street. Whereas in healthcare, we, we have more of an expectation for the leader not to be that, that narcissistic. However, what's really interesting is that the research that some of the research that I mentioned is actually across industries. And what you see across industries is that this issue of narcissism, everyone is charmed by a narcissist leader initially, but then once they work with them, they change their opinion. Now, the one exception that, that I would make to that and, and that is uh, obvious from some research that I didn't mention is um, research uh, is, is organizations under crisis. So this is the one situation where narcissism actually can be very beneficial. Um, there was a study done on organizations during the 2007 economic crisis. And what the researchers found was that those organizations who were led by narcissistic leaders were actually more likely to do better under the economic crisis than other organizations that had more humble leaders. And the explanation that they provide for that is that possibly lack of empathy can be a positive factor under crisis. Of course, not in all situations, but under crisis, when you have to make tough decisions of say closing branches or laying off employees, making those quick decisions under crisis, in that situation, narcissism or lack of empathy can be uh, more beneficial. All right. Um, <clears throat> we do have a couple of uh, comments that uh -huh. have come in. Um, the first is a question um, or a request, I should say, from Logan Woodyard. Please speak a little more on giving negative feedback. You speak of giving feedback to employees that are being trained, but what about when you're training clients or mentoring and coaching? Okay, so, so negative feedback, that's definitely um, a very important aspect of this because a lot of people, when they first hear about humility, compassion, and kindness, the first thing that comes to their mind is that the inmates are running the prison, right? That you're letting people do whatever they want out of your kindness. And this couldn't be any further from the truth. The truth is you can be humble, compassionate, and, and um, kind, but you are still having high standards. You're still accountable and you're still holding others accountable. And, and the one example that I would mention here is, um, you know, giving that, that negative feedback, even if it means giving negative feedback and having to terminate that employee. Um, I'll share a, a story here. So I, I teach an HR course. And, you know, in, in my course, students at some point in time said, you know, we're going to be healthcare managers very soon. And we're really afraid of that situation when we have to give negative feedback to our employees and also when we have to terminate them. So can you bring in someone that can talk about that? So I ended up um, asking 
a graduate of the program, Bob Shaw, who a lot of people are familiar with. He's, he's uh, um, you know, a veteran of the industry, has long experience. So Bob came in and talked to the students about how to terminate people. And the first question that he asked them was, you know, what is the number one factor that you want to keep in mind when you're terminating an employee? And the students start saying stuff such as, well, you have to worry about your own personal safety, you want HR to be in the room, and all of that. And he said, yeah, yeah, all of these things are important. But the number one factor that you want to keep in mind when you're firing someone is to maintain that person's dignity and to make sure that you launch them into something that's more successful. So I believe that this issue of um, providing negative feedback, even the extreme situation where you're terminating the employee, you can still use kindness and you can still use it um, um, uh, compassion when you're doing that. Um, we have uh, another question actually on narcissism. Um, and this one comes from uh, Emma Weidenheimer. What can you do for your own mental health if you find yourself working for a narcissist? Wow, great question. Working for a narcissist. Now, how do you deal with that? There's all kind of different suggestions um, all the way from avoiding that person as much as you can, which obviously is not that effective in the long run. But there, there are some um, situations where you really need to um, stand up for yourself and confront the narcissist. Now, if the narcissist is your boss, that makes things um, uh, somehow hard. But there are situations where you can um, try to separate your own emotions and try to see, all right, what is the best course of action that I can take here to make sure that I can still do my job? Now, as we saw from, from the results of some of this research that I shared, you know, when you're working with someone who is a narcissist or who treats you in a rude way or who disrespects you, you know, we can theorize about how you should react, but really under those situations, you're going to find yourself constantly thinking about that and trying to avoid the person, trying to limit your interactions with them, which leads to an effective situation. So I say, you know, you can give the person several chances, but sometimes you need to ask yourself, is the job worth that that um, emotional burden that's taken on you in terms of dealing with that individual. And that's what the research supports that is the majority of people end up leaving the job, not because of the job itself, but because of the boss. On uh, one more question on the topic of narcissism, uh, Jessica Rabatra asks us, how do you do personal branding mm -hmm. important for certain professions without coming across uh, coming across as extremely narcissistic. Wow, we've got, we're getting a lot of good questions there, and, and uh, that's definitely something that, that um, everyone thinks about um, in terms of how do you make sure that um, people know about some of the things that you're doing without really sounding like you're bragging. And in this situation, I believe that you have to let your work speak for itself. Um, you know, of course, you have to tell people about what you're doing, but not in an over-the-top way, not in a, uh, um, you know, tooting your own horn way, but rather just, um, you know, uh, share what you're working on. And also, I think, you know, again, to, to practice what I'm preaching is, is to stay humble. And, you know, I, I've written a book on the topic, but I can still learn a lot about it. So I'm constantly, whenever I'm talking about the book, my main, um, you know, um, purpose is not just to tell others but also to listen to others because you know people will read the book or, or listen to some of the concepts of the book and they may have different experiences or they may tell you stuff that you learn so to stay open to learning when you are talking about your work I think that's another way to avoid uh, falling into the narcissist trap yeah, that's that was an excellent question uh, we have uh, one more from uh, Takara Christie uh, how do we bring in and begin to reward kindness in the workplace? Right. So if I understand this correctly, the first part of the question is how do we bring kindness in the workplace? And I believe that has to start with hiring practices. And, you know, we are in all industries guilty of falling in the trap of hiring the narcissists versus the others that may be a little bit less quiet. but more capable in some situations. So how, how do you do that? You know, how do you try to screen for that during the recruitment process? Well, one of the ways that I found to be very successful and that some, some companies have in place is they ask during the interview process, you know, tell me about some of the um, successes that you've had in your career. And they watch for the answer that the person is giving. If the person is constantly just talking about themselves and taking credit for everything good that has happened to them in their career, then that's that's probably a red flag for you. You know, of course you want people to tell you about what they've done in previous jobs because that's part of the interview process. But you also want 
to listen for people who give credit to others, you know, who, credit, who give credit to their mentors or to their team members. And sometimes to also just say, you know, I was lucky in that situation and things worked out my way. So you want to be screening for these kind of things. Another thing that I look for when I'm, you know, um, interviewing is also to see the people who say I and me all the time versus we and us and the team. Now, the second part of the question uh, was asking about how to reward it in the workplace. And I think one way to reward it is to make it part of the organizational values and to operationalize that into the performance evaluations that the, the company has in place. You know, you can say kindness is one of our values or compassion is one of our values, but this will remain something that you put in a frame in the hallway unless you translate that into actual behaviors that people can relate with and day-to-day -day things that they can think about. And, as, and then you evaluate them based on these and you say, you know, um, you know you're, regardless of your brilliance, regardless of your competence, you know, your employees are saying or your team members are saying that you, know, te you tend to be disrespectful or you use obscene language, what have you. And if that behavior is repeated, then people you know, are, are told what the consequences are. Um, just one last question, mm -hmm. I think, before we uh, end our session here. Um, you put a lot of information out there for the viewers and listeners today. What if <clears throat> they're saying, I don't see how I can get all of this implemented all at once? Or maybe certain aspects or concepts seem like a bridge too far, yeah. at least yeah. at this juncture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any, uh, any insights into what a starting point might sure. be sure. Uh, for those thinking about taking this sure. home? Absolutely. I would say the way to start is to ask five or ten people that you work with that you really trust to give you feedback on one behavior that you can change. Just one behavior. All right? I've talked about a lot of different things, but you need to start with one. And to keep in mind that you know these behavioral changes, when we talk about behavioral change, we're not talking about a personality makeover. No one can achieve a personality makeover in a short period of time. It's not sustainable. We're human beings. We have our personality. But rather to think about what behaviors you can just dial up by 10% or dial down by 5% to reach that, that ideal performance level. And I think by starting with a close group of colleagues or, or people that you work with or even friends to give you feedback on one thing. So you may start, the, the people may tell you, you know, you know, it will be great if you could listen better. And that will be your starting point. And focus on listening better for the next six months. You know, don't worry about anything else. People tend to think that behavior change is going to be a long laundry list of things that you, ha you have to do all at once. And while I've talked about a lot of things, not every individual needs all of these things. You may be doing all of those other things greatly in a great way. You just want to focus on one or two behaviors and, and achieve that. And another way that people don't think about, but, but that I think leads to being more compassionate, more kind, more humble in the workplace is to take care of yourself first. You know, things that may be on the touchy-feely side but a lot of people believe in, such as meditation, right? Sleeping well, eating well, and exercising, all of these things, these are all things that can mean that you're taking care of yourself and you're, you're showing up in the workplace more relaxed and more able to think about others rather than just yourself. We did. Uh, we actually did get one more question. All right. And this is a good one. It actually may uh, well, let's take it, it may lead you into uh, future research, uh -huh. Dr. Kaisi. Um, this came from Nancy Evans. All the tips are great, but can you speak to the difference between how they are perceived in male versus female leaders? Of course. Of For course. example, some of the tips you've given are contrary to advice uh, given in female leadership training, e.g., Women need to speak up more regarding the value that they've added instead of letting their work speak for themselves. Yes, absolutely. This issue of gender comes up every time I'm talking about this topic. I have a book and I have a chapter in the book that deals with gender. And just to summarize 30 years of research in, in um, one minute, I would say that, that the, um, the, the viewer or the listener is absolutely right. There are gender issues going on there and, and women tend to find themselves in a double bind where on the one hand, they're expected to be more compassionate, more kind, more humble because that's the image that people have of what a female leader look like. However, when you ask someone how they describe a leader, period, they typically tend to think of more of a male 
And, and so that when, when a woman starts acting in a way that is less compassionate or less humble or less kind, people will see that much more negatively than if a man is acting that way. So again, this is, this is a topic that um, requires a lot of discussion, but I totally agree that there is double standards for men and women in terms of these. If there is good news for, for um, you know, for, for women leaders, and I think for everyone here, is that recent research is showing that those so-called feminine, tra feminine traits, um, more, you know, the collaboration and the nurturing are the traits that are required for the leaders um, in, in the uh, 21st century and beyond. So there's evidence that these are the traits that people are looking for more and more. Well, Dr. Casey, uh, and, um, just in watching the comments as they come in, it looks like we had a captive audience and uh, we had a real, lot of really positive feedback. So thank you for taking the time to uh, teach us a little bit about uh, some character traits to take forward to our organization. Um, thank you so much for attending this live webinar. Our next webinar is scheduled for April 27th at noon central time, featuring Mario Gonzalez Fuentes, Assistant Professor in Business Administration here at Trinity University. Dr. Gonzalez will lead a discussion on millennials in Japan and the United States. Thank you. Can I say something before we leave? All right. And um, definitely make sure you tune in for Dr. Gonzalez. He's great. But I want to thank you, Robert, for being here today and for moderating the discussion. I also want to thank Salim Sharif from the Alumni Association. I want to thank uh, Taylor Stakes here at the studio for, for their efforts in making this um, successful. And um, thanks for everyone who watched or listened today.